Hello and welcome to a presentation from the Special and Area Studies Collections at the University of Florida's George A. Smathers Libraries. This talk is part of a series on the past, present, and future of collecting. My name is Neil Weyer, and I'm the curator of the University of Florida's Rare Book Collection. Today, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the book collecting craze that swept Europe in the early 19th century and which helped to create a modern notion of what a rare book was. On the one hand, this is a story about bibliographers, librarians, and the eccentricities of book collectors, but it's also a very human, very universal story about the ways we collect and the reasons why we do it. In a collection like the one at the University of Florida, most of the books that sit on our stacks come from other places, and have taken many different travels on their way here. Even if our shelves bear little resemblance to those in this ornate private library, which was built in the early 20th century to house the collection of financier J. Pierpont Morgan, we will see that they share a common origin story in the rise of the transatlantic book trade. More universally, they also represent a common impulse to showcase and share knowledge, the belief that each collection reflects on each collector whoever they may be. Books have always been rare and precious commodities. They've been works of information as well as art, but they haven't always been valuable or collectible in the sense that we think of them today. This has largely been because their number and their audience has been extremely limited in earlier periods. In the previous episode, we looked at the growth of Renaissance libraries and saw how scholars, printers, and book hunters looked to recover lost knowledge from the past. We also saw their attempts to process this increasing volume of information produced by the printing presses. With the creation of indexes, library, and trade catalogs, bodies of national and international literature became more accessible to scholars and collectors and could be produced more easily by enterprising printers. In other words, it became easier to learn what to collect, and then to find and collect it. Increasing education and rising income also produced a growing number of people who could afford books, and who could cultivate ornate libraries as a way of demonstrating personal taste and commitment to learning. As this community grew, so too did the group of booksellers who catered to them. In the 19th century, these concerns intensified for three reasons. First, the increased mechanization of book production had made books cheaper and more plentiful, indeed more ubiquitous than ever before. Second, the publication of reviews and catalogs made these books more collectible than ever before. And finally, the upheaval of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars put the treasures of country houses and aristocratic libraries onto the market some for the first time in their lives. So the first half of the 19th century was to the book market what the joint stock booms had been the century before. Auction prices were unequaled until our own time. In these auctions, aristocrats and the socially ascendant vied for what they saw as a precious and precarious past up for sale. But the greater availability of books, and the surge in the number of collectors, also increased the fears that these books could fall into the wrong hands. The preceding centuries had given us the image of the book fool, whose enjoyment of his library was limited to its decoration. In the auction houses and bookseller stalls of 19th century Europe, the book fool morphed into the bibliomaniac a collector who pursued his passion past the limits of his own finances and, sometimes, even his own sanity, and whose passion for acquiring books, as many as he could, put him very much at odds with his own modern time and place. It's fitting that the first diagnosis of bibliomania came from a poem written by a Manchester doctor and book collector. In 1831, the novelist and librarian Charles Nodier gave a face to this peculiar malady in a satire he called The Bibliomaniac. Nodier's work presents itself as the funeral oration for the hopeless Theodore, an errant bibliophile who contracts a malady previously unknown to modern medicine, Morocco monomania, 
were the bibliomaniac's typhus, Morocco being a reference to the rich leather that bound ornate book collections. This contagion causes the physical features of books to dominate every facet of Theodore's life. The clothes of his jackets must always be quarto-sized to accommodate a precious volume, and his most haunting nightmares include visions of diabolical bookbinders and mad paper bleachers ruining the large paper copies of his Renaissance imprints. The story's narrator recalls accompanying the convalescent Theodore on a tour of the Paris Keys, where the booksellers dispose en masse of ephemeral titles that had failed to sell. Finally, they arrive at an auction house where the melancholic collector meets his end. He discovers an already sold copy of Virgil's collected works that has margins a third of a line wider than the one that he had long owned and prized, and the disappointment of not having the best copy of something does him in. It's important to know that professionally and personally, Najee lived through the circumstances that created the bibliomaniac. He was librarian of the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal, which had become a public library in 1797. Its collections of medieval materials had then been greatly augmented by the confiscation of private and ecclesiastical libraries during the French Revolution. As an author, he's considered a forerunner to the Romantic movement, and his literary salon in the Arsenal included a young Victor Hugo. But, like his protagonist Theodore, Nodier was also a compulsive book collector. He's recorded to have left the house with money for groceries, only to return with the pockets of his jackets full of precious books. He'd wandered too close to those stalls along the Seine. Nodier's nostalgia for the past shines through in The Bibliomaniac. The narrator comments that he has seen many of his own new works in the five-cent bin, destined for the dustbin of history. In his delightful story, Nodier the Collector poses this question to his readers. In an age where literature was becoming more ephemeral, cheap, and accessible, what value lay in the physical books and the knowledge of the past? In England, this question was answered most vociferously by Thomas Frognall Dibden. Dibden's book, Bibliomania, was subtitled A Bibliographical Romance, but it was in fact a how-to manual. It presented a series of dialogues between college friends who share a passion for books and book collecting. Over the course of several Decameron-like encounters, the group guides an energetic and youthful companion through a course of proper study in bibliography, the single combat of a book auction, and the history of book collecting and antiquarianism in England more generally. Dibden saw himself as an emissary of the virtues of antiquarian book hunting, tirelessly promoting the value of collecting books, both in terms of the pleasure it offered its collectors and the benefits that these collections would accrue to the national character. He packed the pages of his book with notes on the emergence of presses, copies, and collections he had seen. Some of these ran to 40 whole pages of text. He was equally effusive in describing the beauty of books as unique specimens of printing and of art as a way of encouraging interest in the study of particular copies and the emerging discipline of analytical bibliography. Indeed, long after aspiring bibliomaniacs stopped reading the book, it remained a must-have reference work for rare book collections. While Dibden was trying to recruit new audiences of collectors, he had access to some of the most privileged knowledge of his day. As a student at Oxford, his writings on the Greek and Latin classics attracted the attention of one of the foremost collectors of the time. George John Spencer's library contained one of the foremost gatherings of English printing ever assembled, and was further enriched with early continental books through the Earl's purchase of European collections in the wake of the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic Wars. The Earl engaged Dibden to research his books and, indeed, to find new ones. In addition to Spencer's vast library, the Earl's social connections placed Dibden in contact with the most prominent collectors in England of the day, and gave him entry into the first society for book collecting, the Roxburgh Club. The club's name commemorated an auction 
in which a 15th century printing of Boccaccio's Decameron set a record for the most expensive book ever to be sold. It fetched the dizzying price of 2,200 pounds, which is the equivalent of nearly 2 million pounds today. Each Roxburgh Club member attended the yearly dinner held by the Society and presented the club with a limited edition of a rare book from his own collection. Beyond the extravagant socializing, these Roxburgh Club publications formed an early precursor to editions of national literature. They were done by some professional scholars of the time and also used cutting-edge imaging technology like lithography to create facsimiles of ancient and rare books. Dibden's acquaintances in the Roxburgh Club included the politician Richard Heber. Like Spencer, Heber's income came from landed wealth. His large estates in Yorkshire and Shropshire, inherited from his father, provided him with an ample living, and between 1821 and 1825 he represented the University of Oxford as its member of Parliament. His true calling, however, was the acquisition of rare books. He is said to have begun his first library catalogue at the age of eight, and kept a lengthy correspondence with collectors, agents, and friends, which survives today. Heber's library earned him the respect of learned and literary society, and he was also instrumental in the promotion of public institutions. Both Nodier and Dibden echoed a commonly held view of Heber as a model bibliophile, treating him with admiration and respect. Nodier's auctioneer, surveying a pile of original editions of the classics, perfect old copies with the annotations of famous scholars, informed Theodore that they rightfully revert to Richard Heber, to whom we are willing to surrender, with good grace, the Greek and Latin classics which we have ceased to understand. Nodier's playful irony here betrays a true sense of loss, a financial as well as an intellectual surrender on the part of the post-revolutionary order so willing to throw away their own past. Heber's collection, along with the correspondence of its collector, shines light on the ways that private individuals were looking to preserve the printed heritage of nations, or at least were worried about its loss. At Heber's death, his library was left looking for a new home, and eventually went to auction starting in 1836. Estimated at between 100 and 400,000 volumes, the dispersal of such a prized collection of books started a feeding frenzy among a new generation of collectors. Even by the time Heber's books were auctioned, the context for collecting had changed from the beginning of the century. New figures had come into the landscape, notably the professionally trained bibliographer and the institutional library. Although calls for a national library in England had been in the making since the 16th century, it wasn't until the middle of the 18th that an act of Parliament created the British Museum out of the old Royal Library and established the public as a competitor for its own literary and cultural heritage. The British Museum's keeper of manuscripts, Sir Frederick Madden, also exemplified the new type of scholarship taking place around books. Madden was one of 13 children, and his scholarly accomplishments and skill in ancient languages made him a diligent editor and collector of valuable books. His early work included editions for the Roxburgh Club and early learned societies, but it was here that the tensions between the aesthetic and intellectual value of books began to be felt. Many of the collectors that we've discussed so far financed their habits from landed wealth, and the image of an aristocratic dabbler hoarding fine books didn't sit well with the scholarly community. Perhaps no competition shows these changes more clearly than the ongoing rivalry between Madden and the most eccentric bibliomaniac of his day, Sir Thomas Phillips of Middle Hill. Where so many lionized Richard Heber as an open-hearted and generous private collector, far fewer could spare a kind word for Thomas Phillips, particularly those who knew him well. A series of vendettas marked Phillips' adult life, beginning and ending with family disputes over matters of inheritance. His family's fears that Phillips was acquiring too many books were well-founded. He could not stand to lose an auction over a manuscript, no matter how high the cost. As a collector, Phillips approached booksellers with a cautiousness that bordered on paranoia. He was not above using his noble status to avoid bankruptcy or to pressure booksellers into selling large collections directly to him often at a steep discount. 
While Madden had been knighted for his scholarly accomplishments, he and Phillips were miles apart socially. Starting with the sale of Heber's books, Madden's diaries relate countless moments of frustration at Phillips, his carting off loads of precious manuscripts for his own personal amusement, or, Madden feared, his hoarding. Madden also recalled, with some satisfaction, Phillips's purchase of forged artifacts from some of the most notorious fraudsters of the time. Even though Phillips remained reclusive throughout his life, he was known to offer transcriptions and to answer reference questions about his manuscripts, and surely rescued many fragments and items from the scrap heap. Institutions, however, proved more durable. The boisterous depiction of activity in the reading rooms of the British Museum would have set a collector like Phillips's teeth on edge, a sentiment he shared with Madden. But public access like this was a milestone not just in the way that books were used, but in public thought about whom they should be for. In this respect, Phillips and Madden shared one other common personality trait, the single-minded belief that their collection, and no other, was the proper place to preserve the precious remnants of England's past. Well-heeled American collectors also looked to emulate British bibliophiles. Booksellers like Henry Stevens, pictured here, began to create a transatlantic trade in rare materials. In 1845, Stevens migrated to London, where he was put in charge of acquiring rare American books for the collections of the British Museum. In turn, he became the collector for a new generation of American industrial wealth. In 1847, Stevens arranged the sale of the first Gutenberg Bible to cross the Atlantic to James Lennox of New York. Stevens bid for this Bible at a rate so outlandish that even the runner-up, Sir Thomas Phillips, was left in disbelief. A decade later, Stevens would propose a novel idea for what was a very novel institution, a 100,000-volume catalog of an ideal public library for buildings that he saw cropping up in England, in America, and indeed around the world. By the time of Phillips's death, sales to American collectors made up an ever-growing proportion of the market. With the stroke of a pen or the transmission of a telegraph cable, American collectors such as Lennox, the railroad magnate Henry Huntington, or the art collector Henry Walters of Baltimore, were able to purchase world-class antiquarian materials en masse from England's auction houses. In time, these private libraries would form the core of this country's great public and research institutions. By the end of the 19th century, book collecting was no longer the sole purview of scholars, aristocrats, or even private individuals. Yet the aims, the fears, and even the pathologies of these bibliomaniacs still resonate with us today. All of these collectors pursued prized and rare books out of a desire to preserve them, and many then sought to share them with others. After all, who else but a fellow collector could really appreciate what they were seeing when they pulled a prized volume off of a friend's library shelf? So too, their collections reflected the fear that even though the knowledge in books could be preserved indefinitely by being reprinted, books were more than containers of knowledge. Like the book hunters before them, our bibliomaniacs worried that they were losing a connection to the past, not to oblivion, but in the face of a more prominent and persistent present. Many books from many collections sit on our shelves, and each one has a story. To pick one up is to become a part of that story and for it to become part of ours. We cannot pretend that these books are just words on paper or on screens. Using them connects us to the aims and aspirations of fellow collectors, booksellers, and yes, even bibliomaniacs, without whom they would not be in our care today. In future segments, we'll learn more about the collections in special and area studies and the stories they tell about our own institution, but for now, Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you again soon.